Jason Schwartz. And joining us via satellite this morning, we have Representative Pete Roskam, followed by an interview with the Honorable John Engler, President of the Business Roundtable. And finally, we will feature two expert panels. Our first keynote panel this morning features Representative Allison Schwartz of Pennsylvania, who serves as the vice ranking member on the House Committee on the Budget. Representative Schwartz represents Pennsylvania's 13th Congressional District and is currently serving her fourth term in the U.S. House of Representatives. During the 110th and 111th Congresses, she served on the Committee on Ways and Means, which has jurisdiction over federal tax policy. Representative Schwartz now serves on both the Committee on Foreign Affairs and the Committee on the Budget. Joining us also via satellite this morning is Representative Peter Roskam. Currently serving his third term in the U.S. House of Representatives, he is the Republican Chief Deputy Whip, the fourth ranking Republican in the House, and is a member of the Committee of Ways and Means. Representative Roskam is also co author of the Pledge to America. Our moderator for both this morning's keynote interviews will be National Journal's Managing Editor for Budget and Economy, Kristen Roberts. Prior to joining National Journal, Kristen was Washington News Editor and Chief Deputy Bureau Chief for Reuters, where she held positions in the New York, Miami, and Washington bureaus. She covered Wall Street while in New York and then led Reuters' coverage of housing and banking policy and regulation from Washington. Kristen, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Lila, are we waiting for? No, we, we got him. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Hello, Congressman Rossum. <laughs> we see you now. <laughs> Thank you both for joining me and for joining our whole audience here. We've got a really important session of Congress coming up in four weeks now. Uh, up for consideration are billions of dollars worth of tax provisions up for extension, as well as the Bush era tax rates, not to mention the sequester and the possibility of another debt limit discussion. Rather than opening on grim talk of the obstacles, I'd really like to talk about the possibilities here. I'm going to start first with Congresswoman Schwartz. Where do you see the areas of greatest potential common ground and compromise? Well, first of all, good morning uh, to, to you and to everyone here. I'm pleased to be with you and to, uh, to Pete, good morning. Uh, larger than life here, it's, um, uh, right next to us. <laughs> you look great. If you want to, it's always good to know. Um, I, uh, <laughs> before we start, and I do appreciate the opportunity to have this discussion. Obviously, it's an interesting time for us to have this discussion, uh, given that we have an election in three weeks from today. And so what happens in that election obviously will have an impact, even though we will be the same players. Uh, in December as we are obviously in Congress uh, now. Uh, but I do think it will obviously have an impact uh, on how we move forward and what we leave uh, for uh, after the new year and what we actually get done. Uh, I will say I start with the fact that we ought to get something done at the end of the year, whether we actually can do a grand bargain, something really large, take care of all the things we have to do. I feel pretty strongly that we need to make some decisions at the end of the year uh, and uh, set ourselves on a path uh, to a bigger uh, discussion uh, and maybe uh, really some clarity. Let me just say that I think that all of us, Democrats and Republicans, have recognized that we are facing pretty serious challenges and that we should not just punt again uh, for, uh, for a few months. Uh, from the point of view of uh, myself and, and uh, Democrats, we know we have some tough choices to make. Uh, and we feel pretty strongly that we can make those choices, um, but we start with a real understanding, and this isn't just rhetoric, but a real understanding that what we want to do and need to do is to strengthen the middle class and build economic opportunity. And that starts with the middle class uh, and, and really broadening the middle class, and we need to understand that. It also means spending cuts and new revenues. Uh, and that is absolutely important. Uh, the result cannot be revenue neutral even as we, many of us agree, and I'm sure we'll talk more about corporate taxes, uh, that we would like to see the corporate rate come down uh, and, uh, and eliminate some of the uh, special provisions. Um, but we as Democrats have already committed and already voted for and are already engaged in uh, $1 trillion spending cuts over 10 years and another $1.2 trillion either through sequester or through an alternative should we be able to, to come up with that uh, for, re for deficit reduction um, and to uh, grow the economy. Uh, we now need our partners in this, uh, the Republicans, to agree to some revenue. 
it's simply, as you know, not possible for us to get to deficit reduction and to meet our obligations without it. So uh, it is, uh, it's, it's a partnership we've not had uh, yet. So um, what our choices uh, do matter, um, and so just to be clear again, we our priorities and our you want to set as conditions are that we start by recognizing that we have to strengthen and grow the middle class, that we have to protect seniors uh, with Medicare and Social Security, that we do have to make some smart investments to grow the economy in the long term, and that we should do no harm in the short term econ to the short term economic growth because we still are coming out of a very deep, very broad very troubling recession. So um, to assure our economic competitiveness, uh, we understand, and we start with this, that we have to ensure a skilled workforce, that we have to, ha infrastructure matters in terms of roads and bridges and rail and broadband uh, in terms of our economic competitiveness, that we do need access to, uh, to low cost, clean, domestic energy sources, and that we do need to promote entrepreneurship and innovation and that we do have to help ensure that our uh, businesses are uh, economically competitive and the tax policy in a global marketplace and ta tax policy obviously um, affects that. So those are our starting points. I do think there's room for uh, compromise and discussion. There always is. We're members of Congress. We know that. Uh, but we can't, um, we can't get into this uh, debate and be successful if we're faced with rigid, rigid ideology, no, no compromise, no way forward. We have to be willing to, uh, to really look at all of, um, all of the tax pr proposals, all of the possibilities of uh, revenue and spending cuts to get to both deficit reduction and economic growth. But to this qu the specific question of areas of commonality, what are the, the most fertile areas for? Well, I think on that, um, <laughs> well, we, uh, I think one of them for sure is uh, we could move forward on some of the things that we agree on. We agree on middle class tax cuts, you know, the Bush tax for the tax cuts for those, uh, for middle class Americans. Let's get that done. Let's get done the things we know we can do. Uh, we also do agree on, uh, the, on SGR uh, and the fact, something I've worked on quite a bit, that we cannot uh, cut uh, Medicare reimbursements for physicians by 30 percent, that we should repeal the SGR and that we should replace it. I've written legislation to replace it and actually had discussions uh, with Republicans and Democrats about it. It's really close to an understanding of where we ought to get to that would reduce costs will contain the rate of growth and costs. So let's deal with the SGR. Let's deal with the middle class tax cuts. Let's create that. Those are, those are uh, two places uh, we could go. Uh, and I think on the corporate side, we actually, in some ways, that's a little bit easier for us to deal with than on the individual uh, tax side. So uh, if we all do agree that we should examine tax expenditures that are unnecessary, that don't stimulate uh, growth, that are not necessary for um, innovative industries of the future that are outdated, let's get rid of them, let's lower the tax rate. Um, so on the corporate side, the individual side, it's harder, uh, so, but not impossible to, to deal with as well. Okay. But I think those are um, good places to start uh, and would be quite remarkable if we could make some decisions and uh, create our, a path for moving forward. If we have a chance for a big bargain, I'd love to see it, but I think that this, that with three weeks or, or so in December to get this done, I think it's going to be pretty tough to get all the details. We'll get to the done. odds in a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, you know, hopefully the election will show that we actually do have some shared vision on this, that we are going to move forward and we should move forward together. Congressman Rothman, I want to give you a chance to talk about the areas of common ground that you see. Well, I think the areas of common ground are twofold. One is there's a there's kind of a false premise out there that says, well, we don't need more revenue somehow, that that's an argument that's uh, out among GOP circles. And I think um, Mitt Romney debunked that largely. President Obama created a straw man argument in the last debate saying, you believe there's no need for more revenues? Romney said, no, Mr. President, that's not correct. I think the revenues need to come through, through growth. And we can have, I think, a very robust discussion about how you create a growth agenda. Senator Wyden and others have uh, been voices in the I past on the Democratic I side that have articulated a strong growth agenda, and I think that there's a, common, there, there's a commonality there. 
The other component, though, where there is a, a great deal of common ground is the high level of dissatisfaction with the current, the current tax code. There's nobody, there is no voice today uh, that is out defending the status quo as it relates to the current tax code. So if you take that attitude and you look now at what the Ways and Means Committee has done for the past 18 months, Dave Camp gaveled together a series of meetings as chairman of the committee, hearings and really a wide-ranging discussion. And if you were to distill down into a single word the theme of those hearings, it was a theme that Allison just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, and that is competitiveness. How do you create the United States, within the United States, as the most competitive tax jurisdiction in the world? What does it look like? How do you emulate it? Um, you know, Sarah, in her opening remarks, was making an allusion, essentially, to this idea. She didn't speak to it explicitly, but as companies Worldwide American companies are in a position to pursue 95% of the world's consumers who are outside of the United States. There's a recognition that the U.S. tax code should be moving to put them on a platform to do that, to compete effectively. So I think the area of common ground is a recognition of two things. Number one, you need more revenue. And if the Democrats are open to how that revenue, um, that, that revenue comes about, Great. You know, my view has always been, look, if you can get the money that satisfies these obligations, um, that, that, that's an area of common ground, and let's move forward on that basis. And, I, and I'm glad to hear that Allison is not defending this party dogma. Um, the dogma is coming from people like Patty Murray, who are saying, you know, let's go over the fiscal cliff uh, so for the sake of raising taxes. That's an absurd argument, actually, and I'm glad to hear Allison is not, not defending that. The other thing, though, is this level of dissatisfaction, this level of uh, a tax code, that literally we have an army of people in the United States that have to be hired in order to comply with our own tax code. Some estimates say we have 1.2 million people who are in the compliance side. We have 1.4 million people, roughly, who are under arms. State. So it's not an overstatement to say that we need an army to comply with our own rules. Those two areas, the need for revenues and the need for simplicity, I think is a common ground upon which you can really begin to negotiate. Mr. Roskin mentioned Patty Murray and the threats of fiscal cliff jumping, if you will. We've heard that threat from both Democrats um, and Republicans in some form. How big a risk is this or is just this just an opening gambit, Congresswoman? I, I actually don't think we will go over this fiscal cliff. You know, I actually think that we will uh, figure this out. I certainly hope so. Again, we need uh, we need to have some compromise, and uh, we need to be able to to get some revenues. And I, I mean, um, what Pete said sound, is partly true and partly not so true. I think, and I think this is you know, to, all of us would love to be able to say that we're going to just get revenues through economic growth. The problem is if the plan is to reduce taxes for the wealthiest and hope for economic growth. We did that for 10 years and got us into kind of a mess. You might have noticed that. So it's, um, we, and actually what we've done in the past has gotten us into an incredible mess, which was higher deficits um, and actually f not more jobs at all. So um, I think the real question is, what do they really mean by that? It's a really good line. We, liked, we also believe that we are going to eventually, um, economic growth is obviously a part of, uh, of how we're going to uh, raise revenues, but is that enough without any details about how we get there. Well, um, I think you know, if, it, if it is just about lowering um, taxes for the wealthiest, and we've done that before, I think that we do run some real risk of how do we get to where we have to get to, uh, to be able to make sure that we do, if we're serious about the deficit, reduce the deficit, set ourselves on a path for long-term economic growth. Well, I think it's important that we recognize what we're talking about. The, the fiscal cliff is not talking about lowering taxes for anybody. The fiscal cliff is an event where taxes are going to go up. And so the entire question is, what's the impact of that tax hike on the very middle class that both Allison and I are interested in defending? I think that there's a very strong argument that says, look, particularly as it relates to pass-throughs, if you raise these taxes at the individual level, you've got manufacturers out in suburban Chicago 
that I represent, and I'm sure in suburban Philly that Allison represents, and it's going to have an adverse impact on their willingness to take on more risk, to take on more employers, and to do the types of expansion that everybody recognizes is necessary. So there's a false argument that's out there that says this is somehow cutting taxes. No, it's not cutting taxes on anybody. Right now, we're trying to avert the largest tax increase in American history. Let's, let's keep with this middle class theme and with revenue for a moment. One of the most interesting things, um, or at least the more interesting things to emerge of this month out of the presidential and vice presidential debates was a statement last week by Vice President Biden in which he used the $1 million income threshold that was interesting. rather than 250000 that the White House has been using. Um, where is the Democratic caucus on that threshold, Congresswoman? Well, I think it was interesting to hear him uh, talk about that. I can say, <laughs> which I think shows there's a little room for discussion here. But, um, and, you know, some of the, look, I actually, we mostly have been using the $250,000 threshold for family income. And uh, as you know, that really does take care of a whole lot of Americans and small businesses. You know, even at that threshold, you're talking about 97% of small businesses would not see their taxes go up. So when, when Pete talks about affecting small businesses in our community, actually 97% of them are taken care of, unless he's really talking about small businesses that are 499 employees that are making uh, millions of dollars in you know, post-deduction uh, income, net income. So I, I think that that is a, a discussion if it's that we can have. I, look, two years ago when we were having this discussion, I actually proposed $500,000 as, the, as the, uh, the, the place that we could actually go. We, we're serious about deficit reduction. We do think we need more revenues. We do think it matters uh, in terms of uh, future economic growth to our businesses and to um, our workers that we actually invest in education and innovation. Uh, we think that they're an infrastructure. We think that, they're, um, that it matters for us to be able to meet our obligations as a country, and it matters to create some certainty and predictability uh, for, for corporations in terms of tax policy. So uh, those ought to be concerns as well, you know, making sure that taxes don't go up for 99% of Americans or 90 as seven or 98 percent of uh, businesses in this country is actually a pretty good threshold. If there are particular concerns, um, let's talk about that. But I think it is, um, it, if we're going to get to where we have to get to, we have to understand that the rhetoric about hurting small businesses is really not true. Uh, since they, even at the 250, and if we went to 500 or a million, my goodness, we're not talking about small businesses at all. Congressman? Okay, so assume, assume for the sake of argument that that um, you know that everything Allison has said is true. Here's there has been historically. <laughs> oh, listen, uh, I, I uh, assume it's all true. There has historically been a reluctance on the part of both sides of the aisle to raise taxes. In other words, both sides have said, you know what? There's sort of this hand wringing nature, and people say, let's raise taxes as a very last revenue. I mean, a very last gesture. That should be our our last thing that we should do. And so, I mean, we've been challenged implicitly on the GOP side to say, all right, you don't want to raise these rates. What would you do? And that's where I think it is so important to put this in the context of the budgets that the House has passed, not once but twice that were authored by Paul Ryan with very significant numbers that are coming forward. So in other words, here's the specifics, here's the details, this is the remedy, here's the way in which you do this without increasing it. The, the increased tax burden at best is a revenue sideshow. I mean, there's really nobody with a straight face that's saying raising these taxes that the president is proposing is going to close the budget gap. All it is, is uh, it's Democratic Party orthodoxy that is saying we need to continue to cling to do this. So there's a great deal of ambiguity on the Democratic side of the aisle on what the magic number should be. We have the president saying it's 250. We have Senator Schumer who is saying at one point it was a million, and now he's saying he's really not in favor of tax reform as we've come to understand tax reform. You've got Senator Durbin that has said, well, let's extend this for six months and then use that as a bridge to tax reform. But what you see on the GOP side is clarity and unity and a plan that not is just bumper stickers 
but it's articulated, passed language that has now been uh, put over to the United States Senate. So I think that there is a real distinction right now between the two parties and the two visions for taxes. Yeah, let me just say, um, um, there's definitely you know, different world views here. So um, let's just say that what, what we see as uh, being able to offer options and flexibility and to demonstrate that we're willing to engage in this conversation and that we are willing to make some compromise is you could see it as a lack of clarity, which is the way you see it, uh, which I'm surprised about because I think you're one of the opponents we can work with and I hope to work with on, on this, which is that, look, we want to make this work. You know, we are willing to have some discussion. If your concern really is about um, small businesses, not families, but small businesses that are at some threshold, let's have a discussion about that. That's what tax policy is about. Um, if we're going to have some discussion about reducing corporate rates and getting rid of some uh, ta getting rid of all of the tax deductions, or are we going to hang on to some of them that are important to corporate America um, that will help them be more competitive? I think R&D matters, you know, and uh, or if it doesn't, then let's have a discussion about that. I, um, if we, uh, I think we have to be, if you're saying it's lack of clarity, we're saying, look, let's have a serious discussion about how we get to a, a place. What, what you see is the Ryan budget as being um, clear policy, we're like, what do you really mean? There's a whole lot of lack of information there. What is clear in the Ryan budget, of course, is, this, is shifting costs to, to uh, middle class Americans. We know that. Certainly it ends Medicare as we know it. You know that. Um, that may matter to you. It may not matter to you. Um, uh, maybe it matters to you personally, I would think, actually, and to your parents. But um, that we see that as rigid ideology that you know, the notion that we can just say we're going to grow the economy by lowering tax rates, um, that's going to bring in new revenue, although we can't tell you how, that that's a real problem, that what we do, it will undermine what we do uh, as, together as a government. It means uh, the proposal, the way Mitt Romney's talking about it, the proposal way the Ryan budget, that you're right, all the Republicans voted for, um, really does do some dramatic um, harm, I, we believe. Uh, to uh, what the government has done in terms of meeting our obligations. Certainly true in Medicare. Uh, it is also true in terms of the kinds of cuts we would see uh, in, in what we do that you rely on us to do. And again, you know, roads, bridges, highways, broadband, tr skilled workforce, access to education, um, the uh, health reform and bringing down the cost of health insurance coverage, I mean, the clean energy. It means all those things do not matter at all to corporate America that you can live without government doing anything, and so can middle class families. It's really not true, right? So if, you know, if we go that direction, you may say, look, it's gonna lower our rates, but do we, have to, do we want this trade-off? And I think it's too strong a trade-off for the American people to undermine our ability to meet our obligations to our um, to current Americans and obviously to economic competitiveness in the future. So it's finding the compromise that is has to come from what are really is a wide divide you just heard even between Pete and myself who are really pretty moderates on both sides or at least um, we hope so <laughs> you know in in being able to say we we know it is complex that we give tax deductions that are no longer necessary um, that should either go away because we could then lower the rate or it should be used in some other way that incentivizes uh, the future uh, economic competitiveness that you need and that you want. Uh, if we can get there, we can't get there if there's this notion that they consider revenues future economic growth. We consider revenues both um, actual dollars coming into the government and economic growth. And without those dollars to meet our obligations, even as we cut government and we have, even as we look for cost containment everywhere and we have, uh, that we actually do still have some responsibilities uh, to each other and to our economic competitiveness in the future. And we need dollars to do that. So there is a great divide here, but it is not new. It is something we've been talking about for well more than a year, two years at this point. But there are some dangerous undertones here. These things have become defining issues for both parties. For the Democrats, raising taxes on the wealthy has in some ways become a defining issue, especially in this campaign. For the Republicans, no new revenue has become a defining issue. Congressman, and more cuts, as a matter of fact. Congressman, how is that going to affect your ability to work toward a deal by the end of this year? Can you move off of 
what has been not only a rhetorical platform, but something that has affected the way you negotiate. Okay, so one of the premise of your question, though, is that somehow the GOP is arguing don't have any new revenues. And this was debated between the presidential candidates the other evening. I made this point earlier. We accept the premise that you need more revenues. We reject the premise that the only way to get more revenues is by raising taxes and making them uh, more, I would argue, confiscatory. Allison wouldn't characterize it that way. Okay. But if Democrats can say, look, we're interested in more revenues too, here is this pathway that the Republicans have described, we think that it makes sense, I mean, we're, we're willing to listen and we're willing to learn, there's growth assumptions in President Obama's budget, there's growth assumptions in uh, the budgets that the House articulated, the House minority put forward, we've not seen any budgets obviously from the, from the Senate, but there are growth assumptions. Let's go in and explore those. But there's somehow this, this notion that the only way to get more revenue for the federal government is by raising taxes is a choice that we don't think is robust. And historically, it has been one that people have come to um, only reluctantly. And so we're saying, look, good news. If we both agree there's a reluctance to raise taxes, then let's not go there as the first place, and let's explore every other conceivable opportunity. We think that there's an opportunity to, to look at this growth model, and here it is, and let's pursue that. Now, the, the bottom line is the election on November 6th is going to have a huge disposition on this question. And um, it's my hope that we can, we can uh, forego the drama around the fiscal cliff that we can move these sequestration alternatives that the House has done, that we can bridge and extend the rates for another year and, and move this debate into tax reform. But the November 6th election is going to be incredibly consequential in terms of the energy that comes out of that election and the trajectory of where the public wants to go. I, just one second. I want to stick with this for one minute. I understand the, the argument for uh, revenue via growth. But how strong will the no new tax revenue position be during the lame duck session within the Republican caucus? Very strong. So we've heard from the president in the past. You know, obviously the president, um, if he's elected, he'll obviously have a second term. If he's not reelected, then he'll be president until January 20th or 21st on the new inauguration day. But you will, we, we, we've heard President Obama in the past make declarative statements about tax rates. And he's demonstrated, shall we say, a great deal of flexibility uh, when the time has come down to it. And we think that based on the mixed signals that are coming from the Democratic side um, and the clear signals that are coming from the Republican side, that you will see, a, you know, uh, the, the idea that I think President Obama signs an extension of the current rates for another year, in my opinion, is more likely true than not true based on his past conduct. Yeah, um, let me just say this growth model. I mean, look, I, it is true that none of us, actually, most of us, I will say for myself, we don't want to raise taxes. Um, but as Pete pointed out, the issue is do we extend tax cuts or not for some Americans uh, in order to meet our obligations and to be able to make sure we actually can reduce the deficit. I mean, that is something we want to do. So it's not like we do it gleefully, but we do believe, uh, well, uh, that in fact, um, raising taxes on millionaires, start there if you want, uh, and uh, it really would produce some income for the in increase in revenues and not hurt uh, the economy at all. Uh, that in fact, going from 35% to 39% is not going to undo the economy and brings in some important revenue for us to meet our obligations. Uh, that's what the president has proposed. That actually seems a um, somewhat reasonable way to go. It did not work under the Bush years, so let's, again, do what we actually already agree on, which is to extend middle class uh, tax cuts. Look, so we don't believe in supply side economics. We don't believe in trickle-down economics. It hasn't worked by uh, making sure, and again, we, we do believe in making money, though. We're perfectly happy with uh, the fact that Americans, and we want to encourage more Americans to be successful and to uh, make money and to be prosperous, um, and then to pay uh, taxes into what we do jointly. Uh, and that's, that's the difference. We're not, if you want to use the Pete's terminology, we're not raising anyone's taxes. 
we're actually just not extending tax cuts on a small group of Americans um, who have additional money to, uh, to potentially give us a few extra percentage points because we need the money. If we didn't, if the deficit wasn't an issue, if the Republicans really don't care about the deficit, that's not real to them, um, that we will be able to still do what we believe has to happen for economic growth, and that is to put more money in middle class Americans' pockets so that they buy more products, so then companies want meet that demand. I mean, that is the way we look at it, uh, that unless you actually have consumer demand, then in fact it doesn't matter what kind of gifts we give you, it just makes you richer, it doesn't actually make you want to make more products. Um, so it's, it's a different economic philosophy. We think that under the Bush years, if you noticed, we actually uh, did actually have, end up with a very troubled economy and deep recession, that if it worked, if their principles worked, that that economic growth that Pete's talking about, that Mitt Romney's talking about, uh, that Paul Ryan's talking about worked, we wouldn't be in the mess that we were in four years ago. And I think you believe that. If we want to get serious about competitiveness for corporate America in the future, you, you have all talk to me about um, the fact that you'd like to see lower rates, you want to be more competitive in a global marketplace, we have to bring down the cost of health benefits, which is what we're, we're doing by bringing down, uh, by demanding uh, better efficiency and, and, uh, and cost containment in the healthcare sector across both private and, uh, and public sector, uh, that you need uh, cheaper energy, that you need a skilled workforce, that you need airports and, and tra rail that work. Uh, and that you can't do it with all the, out those things just on your own. Now, that's what you've said. You said you're willing to give up some of the tax deductions for that, if not all of them. But the notion that this concept, which we've actually lived through several decades now, that if you just reduce the taxes more so on the wealthiest Americans, leave middle income Americans on their own with fewer dollars in their pocket, if you hold them hostage again, uh, by not extending the tax cuts, if you hold corporate America hostage by not actually reaching agreement on taxes for the future, it puts you in a much more difficult position to do the kind of planning, the kind of um, growth that you would like, uh, both here in the United States, which is what we'd like, and of course the work that you do in selling products across the world. So I think this rhetoric is really just that. Um, unless you're really me, willing to decimate we the federal government and all of the obligations and expectations you and uh, our middle class families expect. Congressman. Let me respond if I could because I think that there's a flaw in the argument that Allison was just articulating. It's a subtle pivot point, but the subtlety is worth revisiting. So on the one hand, that argument says, well, if you raise these taxes, then that money is somehow going to be the remedy to increased infrastructure and broadband and skilled workforce and all of these things and that money will go to bridge that gap but on the other hand balancing against that is the Ernst & Young study that says if these tax rates expire then what will happen is it will cost 700,000 jobs look I'm calling you I'm talking to you to the state how not to govern so the state of America did all the things essentially that the Democratic leadership is currently claiming they want to do. That is, raise taxes, it has chased an entrepreneurial class out of Illinois. Our neighbors in Wisconsin and Indiana and Iowa and Ohio and Michigan are doing much better than us. We've got higher than average unemployment. We've got more per capita debt than any state in the union, and this is the playbook. Now, I've made the argument before that when President Obama has said the private sector is doing just fine, he can't hardly blame him because he's using the state of Illinois as his, as his foundation point. So what we're saying is, let's not, don't mess with this. Don't trifle with this. It doesn't close the budget gap at the outside. Raising these taxes, you know, closes, gets you about two weeks of revenue under the Obama uh, current spending trajectory. Don't fall into that trap. <coughs> when originally asked Bill Clinton, they said, should you raise taxes? He said no. Now we said no for about seven hours till the White House walked him back. But even President Obama, when he was asked back in Elkhart, Indiana, back in the 09 cycle, he was asked, do you raise taxes during a recession? And President Obama was basically making the argument that I've been making, essentially, and now that's not his current position, obviously, but I think he got it. Now, are we not in a recession right now? Technically, we're not. You know, we're growing. Our nostrils are just above the 
surface of the water were grown at about 1%. But let's not do anything to put a very tender-footed economy back in any more jeopardy. And I just don't think people with a straight face can really make the argument that the remedy to growing the economy and creating more expansion and people willing to invest more is somehow raising taxes. I mean, I, I, I know we have to move on, but let me just say, look, we don't think that that's the end-all and be-all, but we do think that some, we, we ought to have that on the table, that it actually won't hurt the economy. We've been the ones who have also been saying, I think we agree on this, uh, Pete, is that the, the economic recovery, you know, it's been, uh, we've seen economic growth for the last 32 months, you know, that it's not as strong as we'd like, but it is a whole lot better than where we were four years ago in losing jobs, 500,000, 600,000, 700,000 jobs a month. It's a whole lot better to be growing jobs. We would like to be growing them faster. Of course we would. It's a slower recovery, but it is a recovery. And we would agree with you that I think that there's been a lot of openness on the part of Democrats and certainly the White House that what we do in the next year, we've been pretty careful. Uh, and what we're looking at is a long-term discussion. Do we extend you know, how do we handle tax policy? Look, I think it also is how do we get to the serious discussion you want us to have? Well, which the long is really term discussion. A long term discussion is something we'd like to get to, and it's partly getting past the Bush tax cuts. Let's, let's resolve those. Let's uh, extend the ones for the middle class. Let's not extend the ones for the very wealthiest Americans. It's not going to hurt our economy. It's going to bring in some dollars. And then let's have the serious conversation about both individual and corporate taxes for the future. The long-term discussion has to talk about the, the other side of that ledger. We've been talking about taxes here. We do need to talk about entitlement spending. We have to go to questions, um, and then we're going to come back and talk about entitlements and the kind of flexibility the Democratic caucus would give a, you know, assuming a re-elected President Obama to make the yeah. kind of deals that we were on the table two years ago. We have a question right here. Hugh Grindstaff, retired. Uh, Congressman Roskam, you signed the Norquist Pledge. How can you possibly come to any kind of compromise without being the one congressman out of uh, I don't know how many uh, that would have to break the pledge to come to a compromise with the Democrats. Right. I, if you've been listening, I'm not contemplating breaking the pledge. <laughs> what I'm saying is you can pursue revenues. Revenues are abundant. There's a possibility of getting them and I think a likelihood. This was debated the other night where Mitt Romney spoke directly to President Obama about this. The president said, you don't want revenues. Romney said, I do want revenues, but the way to revenues is through growth. So that's been the conversation that Allison and I have been having for the past 20 minutes. It comes down to a world view that she described, but um, I think that there's consistency there. So I don't, I don't uh, plan on raising taxes on anybody. Another question? Does that include not extending tax cuts? Would that be breaking the pledge? There's so many double negatives that are going on in my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but look, if it gives you a little flexibility to reach agreement, uh, you know, a couple of days, you know. Allison, you know me. I'm very reasonable. <laughs> I'd love to work on an agreement. Can I follow up this? But, Congressman, isn't your pledge to the citizens of Illinois and not to the citizens, not to one person? That That's one thing that a lot of people who aren't in favor of the pledge can understand is that you should be serving your constituents and not one man. Well, I appreciate the admonition and I appreciate the encouragement. I've been reelected three times to Congress and I think I'm looking very strong right now. So the voters of the 6th District of Illinois are going to make that determination. Thank you. Another question from the audience? All right, then let's go to this question of entitlements. Let's assume for a moment that President Obama wins re-election. How much flexibility to deal on entitlements will the Democratic caucus allow him? Well, I'd say this. It starts with uh, our commitment to meeting uh, the promise of Medicare and Social Security. That has to be the beginning of the debate. It can, we will not accept um, turning Medicare into a voucher, premium support, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that, is, that is a non-starter for us. Uh, we feel that it, uh, if the beginning premise is that we will not uh, shift the costs uh, essentially completely almost, uh, you know, we'll send the, the, certainly the increase in costs uh, to individual seniors and their families, uh, then I think we can have a discussion. I think we also have to begin the, the discussion with the fact that uh, what has been said by both Mitt Romney and obviously Paul Ryan and, and the, uh, all of the Republicans that the Affordable Care Act, actually, Affordable Care Act hurt Medicare, 
uh, is also a non-starter for us because we, they know the reality is, one is that the Republicans and Paul Ryan use the same $700 billion in cuts to insurance companies and to providers in their budget. Um, and in fact, what we have done is instead put ourselves on a path towards greater solvency in Medicare, towards re uh, containing the rate of growth in costs in Medicare through improved delivery system uh, reforms. So if we can start with the discussion of how can we best reduce the costs uh, in, in Medicare, which is through delivery system reforms. Uh, that is important to all of us. That could also have an effect on the private sector and reducing costs uh, for health coverage for um, all Americans. But it's got to start with a different premise, and we're really far apart in the premise. Uh, and of course, Republicans um, originally walked away, when Republicans in Congress walked away from the original vote for the Ryan budget, but then they voted again, and now many of them have embraced the notion that what we should do is to end Medicare as we know it and make it uh, save the dollars for the, for the government and leave seniors and their families more on their own. $6,000 in the first year or two obviously going up from there. I think that's a non-starter, um, but I do think that if we could reach agreement, and that's a big if, on the fact that Medicare is important to our, our seniors and their families, that it can work, that we can um, have the dollars to make it work. Are there ways that we can ensure that it is, um, you know, that we actually make sure it's solvent for years and years and years? Of course, I think there's some discussions that we could have, but it's not yet a good discussion we can have. Congressman, where do you need to see Democrats move on Medicare? Well, I think that, um, you know, if, if Allison big if, is that Republicans care about Medicare and want to make sure it's solvent. Good news, we care about Medicare and want to make sure it's solvent. The challenge is that Medicare as we know it will end in 12 years. That is the time at which the Medicare trustees recently testified to the Ways and Means Committee that Medicare will reach insolvency. Look, there was a, there was a serious effort on the part of several major initiatives over the past couple of years to bring some clarity to this issue. We saw the Fiscal Commission, we saw the Super Committee, we saw the negotiations between the Speaker and the President around the so-called grand bargain. I think what's got to happen is President Obama needs to step into the breach if he's reelected. What he's got to do is, and, and in, in the, you know, the Woodward book and other places, there was a recognition that the President had about the, not, not embracing the House GOP approach, but recognizing that it is that program, that is the fact that 10,000 seniors or 10,000 boomers are retiring every 24 hours, and healthcare inflation is outpacing regular inflation significantly, and it's continuing to happen, notwithstanding the passage of the new health care law. So I think what's got to happen is actually President Obama needs to step in in a way that he has not done that in the past. Now, that's been his prerogative. He's the President of the United States. But if we want to have a transformational moment as a country, if we want to come together around a shared premise that it is the entitlement programs largely that are driving these budget questions and are beginning to crowd out these other things, then we need the President of the United States really to play a leadership role and it's not a leadership role that I've seen, or I think really the country has seen from President Obama for the past four years. Now there's good news. I served for four years with President Obama when he was a state senator, and we were together in Springfield, Illinois. What I saw there was an attribute in Barack Obama, then a state senator, where he was able to, to really cross party lines in a very sincere way. He and I worked together on some controversial death penalty reform legislation that we were able to pass out of the state senate and the state house unanimously and it was signed by the governor. I, I used that as a touch point when President Obama came to the, the House Republican <coughs> retreat a couple of years in Baltimore and I said, Mr. President, that style of governing is so successful and it's my hope that he goes back to that background, and I know he's got it in him, we just haven't seen it for the past you said that, you know, it, you are absolutely right. President Obama has created, has led by being willing to talk to both sides of the aisle. The number of times that he invited Republicans to the White House, the number of times he has said, I don't want to dictate exactly how you do this. This is our goal. Let's talk about this. That's exactly 
President Obama's leadership style. You both say it's not leadership because he actually didn't dictate to Congress exactly how to do things, and then you just praised him for being willing to be open to finding that common ground. I well, actually think that that's a good, I think that that's an important um, uh, acknowledgement that you just made, which is great. The fact is that we do recognize uh, that there are serious costs under Medicare, 10,000 new seniors a day, there are probably some of you in the audience um, who are baby boomers, um, but in fact when Paul Ryan says it won't be there for him, he's actually not quite correct because really the baby boomers are not going to last forever, although we're going to try. Um, you know, it is, um, the, the fact is that this is a demographic and a per capita problem. You know, the, the demographics are daunting. For the next 20, 25 years, you have another 40 million seniors coming online, but then we go away at some point. Again, you know, and it's hard for me to acknowledge that, but um, for those who are 35 or 45 now, that is not going to be the same problem. So let's look at the reality of Medicare actually being a lower cost in a lot of ways than private health insurance, uh, that in fact we have seen uh, the rate of growth in health care not grow as quickly as it did. We were seeing double digit growth, doubling the, the cost of premiums for, for companies who pay health benefits and of course for, for government's high costs. Uh, we need to rein that in. There are ways to, to do that that we want to be very um, aggressive about as a matter of fact, and we are. Um, and so uh, we, we need to also make some conditions here. And again, the conditions are that Medicare has worked and Social Security has worked for seniors in this country. It is something that whether you're already over 65 or whether you're 55 um, or whether you're 45, you actually do anticipate and have planned for Medicare being there for you. It would be enormously disruptive uh, in this country to have it go away, to shift those costs to those families. We need to recognize that. So do we have work to do together to make sure that we can afford to pay for it, that prescription drug coverage, um, it, which was unpaid for under George Bush, we're actually many of us glad that there's a prescription drug coverage. Um, how do we actually fill in that gap if uh, the Affordable Care Act is repealed on day one, the way Mitt Romney says? All that cost in prescription drugs goes back onto seniors of, uh, individual families um, and that we have not closed that, that gap. So look, there's a huge divide here. If the Republicans are serious about working with the President and working with Democrats to preserve Medicare, truly preserve Medicare, um, not to just say we are for Medicare but we're going to then turn it over to, uh, to individual seniors, I think there are ways we can have that discussion about how to contain the rate of growth in costs per capita and to deal with what is going to be a serious problem from the budget for the next 25 years. Congressman Roscom, you're going to get the last word. Well, I think there's so many uh, descriptions of the Medicare situation that I would, that I would disagree with. Um, but let me talk about what I, what I do agree with. Where we have an opportunity is for President Obama, if, if he's willing to reevaluate how he's conducted himself under the first presidency now, or his, 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 his term. Now, what do I mean by that? The Barack Obama that I served with when we were negotiating various things, it was very much a negotiation. So I was able, because I'm coming from the conservative point of view, I was able to go to the police and the prosecutor organizations and push them and say, look, we need your help and so forth. Because of President Obama's worldview, coming from the liberal point of view, he was able to go to the defense bar and to the ACLU and to push them. Together, we were able to do something that was good. Barack Obama has redefined bipartisanship, though. Now the definition of bipartisanship is, you vote for my stuff. And if you look at the Woodward book, if you look at widely reported pieces that are coming out of the Post and elsewhere, it has been, yeah, a lot of chatter, but when, the, when it comes down to it, it is, you vote for my stuff. He was flummoxed and disappointed and frankly surprised that there were no Republican votes on the stimulus plan. Turns out, upon reflection, that was a good move. The stimulus is largely underperformed. Democrats are not running on the stimulus. So I'm not interested in relitigating these past things. But what I'm saying is, yeah, I'm, I think we need to see an attribute in President Obama that is clearer, that, that leads, that recognizes in John Boehner, he's got a willing partner to try and sit down and negotiate. I hope that he's learned from the experience around the debt ceiling drama and the debate and sort of that whole high stakes adventure. And he's able to say, look, we're not going to do that again. I recognize in Boehner the type of style in somebody that I can negotiate with and I can work with. 
and bring John Boehner along rather than just saying, just vote for my stuff. It's not very persuasive, and this is why we are where we are. All right, well, thank you both for coming. I wish we had come closer together. <laughs> I thought John Boehner really got pretty close with the president, and then when he went back to his conference, couldn't get there. So um, we have work to do, Pete. We really do in, in moving beyond the rhetoric, and hopefully the election will make absolutely clear that what the American people are hoping for us to do uh, in the way we tackle both the fiscal cliff at the end of the year, but then obviously future tax reform. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. That was a terrific panel. Um, our next keynote interview this morning.